So I think we need to recognize this, and I know that I think we've already talked about some of these things. So the nature of pain, um, first of all, intensely personal and subjective. A really good analogy for me to draw here would be if I were to ask you to rate, I don't know, how happy you are on a 0 to 10 scale. If you thought about that right now, how happy you are. Zero is you're not happy at all. Ten, you're extremely happy. Could you, could you rate that? Could you give me a number? You might think about it for a second. You might toss out a number if I was to guess, because you're sitting in a classroom at quarter after nine on a Saturday morning. It's going to be mid-range somewhere, would be my, my suspicion. I'm going to save the rest of that comment here for another slide. We also recognize that it's a protective mechanism, as has already been said. It's necessary for our survival. It's more than an intense, unpleasant experience, though. Most commonly, pain goes along with things like what? A withdrawal reflex, right? Lift your foot up from whatever you're about to step on, take your hand off, whatever that is. So there's a motor output there. Stress system activity. This has become an area that uh, Josh and I are really becoming quite interested in. It's this idea of stress system uh, um, response to pain and trauma and how that sort of interplays with each other. Autonomic activation, certainly it's not uncommon that your heart starts to race a little bit, perhaps you sweat a bit after you've just had a, a very near, nearly damaging experience. Immune and inflammatory activation, recognizing that your brain picks up threat, signals of threat to the body. In order to mitigate threat, we usually have to initiate some kind of immune or inflammatory reaction to try and address maybe tissue damage or perhaps some kind of invasion into our body. We haven't really touched on this one yet, but I think it serves a social function. Think about the last time you were at home and you know you stubbed your toe, you whacked your thumb with a hammer, you stepped on some glass, whatever. Okay. You probably hopped around a little bit, you probably went, oh man, that was stupid. But when there's nobody else there, really beyond that there's not much point. Right? <laughs> But when there's other people there, and especially if we think we're in the presence of somebody who might care for us or help us, then chances are our reaction is going to be a little bit more exaggerated, perhaps as a term. Um, interestingly, on the other hand, if we're in the presence of somebody who either we think isn't going to help us, so let's say somebody who's maybe overly punitive, for example, or perhaps in the presence of someone who uh, we're trying to oppress, and maybe we also won't jump around quite so much. Look, I just slammed my hand in the door, and it doesn't hurt at all. <laughs> uh, I used to ride my bike all over town here when I was a student, a physio student back in the 90s. And of course, I'd get into all sorts of crashes. I'd, always, I'd flip my bike lots of times. Every time, every time, what happens? You get up, immediately you spring back up. Blood running down your leg, your handlebars are all twisted. What do you do? You hop back on the bike, you go, I'm fine. And you take off until you're like a kilometer down the road. And then you go, oh man, that hurt, right? Because again, same thing. You don't want people stopping and going, oh, are you okay? Right? You know, there's, a, there's a social response here that I'm trying to initiate. Um, if, if people are interested in understanding a bit more about the social functions of pain, I've put a couple of uh, things here that you can, you can Google. You can jump on the PubMed if you want, or, or you take a look at them. The communal coping model is one, and the biopsychomotor model uh, is another. And both of them have sort of overlap here, and that really has to say that with the fact that really what, what we observe as pain, so I'm a clinician, or I'm just a friend, or I'm a family member, and if I watch you and you're wincing, or you're bracing, or you're guarding, or you're saying this really hurts, or you're using words, all of this is meant to convey some kind of message to me that you need help. Okay? So this idea that there's an interaction here. An interesting question becomes, if we didn't have those outward displays, would we actually have pain? Is pain really just what we can see in other people, just the outward displays? It's sort of an interesting discussion. Maybe we'll have a little bit of sometimes. I'm going to pitch this question out there. Hey, buddy. Just to clarify, the biopsychomotor model and the biopsychosocial model, are they two different things? Or are they, they are slightly. So the biopsychomotor model is something that a fellow by the name of Mick Sullivan pitched um, maybe three or four years ago. Um, he's the only one who's really put that out there. He's published it. 
And Mick uh, Reggie, we'll run into his name again later on today, he created things like the Pain Catastrophizing Scale in the Injustice Experience Questionnaire. He's at McGill. Um, yeah, so he took the social term and changed it to motor, representing the, um, the wincing, the vocalization, the gracing, the guarding, all that sort of thing. Just as a slight, a slight shift, but yes, it is slightly different. Yeah. This statement has been around for a long time. Capri, 1968. Pain is whatever the experiencing person says it is, existing whenever the experiencing person says it does. What does this mean for us as clinicians? What does it mean if Alex is sitting here and says, my pain is 10 out of 10? But he behaved just like this. What do I do with this information? Should I doubt his ability to understand pain? What do you think? Or do I just accept it as is? I mean, really, you've kind of got two options here, right? You can either accept it as is, okay, you're telling me your pain is 10 out of 10, or you can sort of scrutinize that a little bit. You can doubt it a little bit. And this kind of comes back to this statement. I guess maybe I'll put this out there. Are we willing to accept this? Is anyone not willing to accept this? I'll say that. I'd like to have a little bit of skepticism. Okay. Scientific skepticism. Scientific skepticism like that. <laughs> that's, that's what we do. Scientific skeptics. All right. That's fine. All right. So, so the statement then was that um, it may be indica indicating other things are experiencing this rating of a 10 out of 10 pain. Right? That there may be other things that are worth exploring. Is that what I'm meaning to say? I feel like, like they might say something, but it might be like there are so many other factors that like maybe they're not telling the truth, maybe they are. Um, what else, what other things can you kind of take from them mm -hmm. that might lead you to think they are telling the truth or not, or like something along those lines, I guess? Yeah. I think it's kind of your bias too, right? So have you seen someone else in a particular situation before and how sure. they react and like you gather all that information, then you might have a better idea. There are always two players in this interaction, aren't there? There's the patient, who is giving us a rating and it's necessarily filtered through their understanding of this pain rating and everything, but then there's me and I'm taking that in and I'm filtering it through my own understandings, my own experiences, right? So I think that's very important to keep in mind. I was going to say, I completely agree with this, but I find it empowering, not demotivating because it means it, through what you do, you can change their attitudes towards what they're experiencing and you can change it quite readily. Great. So the, this, the comment was that this is potentially empowering rather than demotivating. I'm going to go back to my analogy of my happiness scale. And let's say I ask you guys how happy you are, and one of you says you're 10 out of 10 happy. Now, if I was to disbelieve you, how silly would that seem? You're not 10 out of 10. When I'm 10 out of 10, I'm laughing, I'm dancing, I'm whatever, I'm smiling all the time, you're not doing the same things I'd be doing if I was 10 out of 10. And substitute that with anything. Love, how in love are you? Oh, I'm 10 out of 10. You're not 10 out of 10. If you were 10 out of 10, you'd be smooching and canoodling and all these sorts of things. <laughs> no, I think, I, uh, well, while this, this comment occasionally comes under a little bit of fire, a little bit of debate in the academic literature, I still subscribe to this personally. And um, I like the comment that uh, it is worthwhile then exploring this experience further. You know, sure, I've seen lots of people who've rated their pain at 0 to 10, and lots who have rated their pain at 10 out of 10. And in my head, I have a sense of kind of generally how folks look. But really, that's just been my own experience. And I'm, I'm probably coloring that by how I would behave if I was saying my pain was 10 out of 10. But how I would behave when I'm 10 out of 10 is completely irrelevant to how you're behaving when you're 10 out of 10. So I don't quite uh, always understand why it is that folks question this. In fact, I'm gonna I've got a couple of little readings here. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you this one here. So um, those who are looking for additional readings, this is a good one. Uh, it's called Pain: A Textbook for Therapists, specifically actually more for PT and OTs. Uh, written with uh, with that, those folks in mind, written by a couple of PTs and OTs actually. So I'm gonna I'm gonna give you this uh, this little passage here. 
from McCaffrey and Beebe, 1989, same McCaffrey. Here we go. No matter which approach we use in responding to the patient's report of pain, we will eventually make a mistake. If we doubt some patients and withhold treatment, we may avoid being fooled by the minority who are addicts, abusers, or malingerers, but we will eventually fail to help someone who does have pain. On the other hand, if we give everyone the benefit of the doubt and try to relieve pain in all who say they have it, yeah, we will be fooled by some who are addicts, abusers, or malingerers, but we will never fail to help someone who does have pain. Either way, we'll make a mistake. Therefore, we must address our professional responsibility and consider which mistake we can afford to make. I guess I've always thought that at the end of my day, I need to go home, put my head on the pillow, and go to sleep feeling like I've done a good job. And I'd have a hard time doing that if I thought I had withheld treatment from somebody who actually needed it, even if it meant I was fooled by someone who didn't really need it. I'm much more comfortable saying, ha, huh, you got me. Good on you. Well done. You totally faked me. Then I am saying, wow, I'm sorry I didn't treat you. I'm sorry I disbelieved you. So anyway, something to keep in mind. Um, I, do, I do subscribe to this. What do you think?